Well, good morning. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Luke, uh, chapter 24. That is the last chapter in the book of Luke, and we are going to uh, be hanging out in this chapter, in this book, for the next three weeks. Uh, So Luke 24. If you don't have a Bible this morning, I'm going to have all the verses on the screen for you, so we're not going to leave you behind, but I'd love for you to follow along with me in your device or in your Bible. And while you're doing that, I'd like to just introduce myself each and every morning. If you're new here, and a new place is scary, and new faces are scary, and I I get that, so I just want to say, I'm not implying that your faces are scary, I'm implying that my face is scary. Let me just, yeah, hey, my first amen of the morning. Perfect. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, But uh, my name's Doug. I'm the lead minister here at Sugar Grove Church of Christ, and I'd love to meet you after the service. Andy, what Andy said is true. I would love to invite you to get a cup of coffee or chips and queso, uh, two of God's greatest gifts on earth. Uh, Just tell you about the story of Sugar Grove, who we are, where where we think God's leading, and find out about your story and help you connect with some of the amazing people here. I've been been walking with this community for just over two years now, and I wouldn't want to do life with anyone else, and so I'm very biased, and I think they'd be good for you too. So come find me after the service and uh, introduce yourself, and we can, we can set that all up. And then I like to say hi to everybody who's joining us on Facebook every morning, uh, including saying my hi, hi to my mom and dad who live in Chicago, so good morning to you, mom and dad. It was a kind of way to honor them. But this morning, I want to say hi to someone special, and I'm actually going to need your help with this. Uh, one of our Dearly loved members, Judy Harris, uh, several months ago, she had a heart attack and a stroke. And it wasn't looking very good for a while, uh, but she's doing much better. And, but she's in a rehabilitation center that makes it really difficult for her to come join us on a Sunday morning. And so this morning, Terry Singleton, who's also a member here at Sugar Grove, he's gone to be with Judy, and they're watching right now. And so I told Tyler to really pan out. And so I want to invite everyone to turn around and just wave hi to Judy and tell her that we love her and we miss her. Hey, Judy, how's it going? See, we see you. And Terry, we're glad that you're there with her. In fact, hey, I'm going to ask Doc, one of our elders, uh, to just say a prayer over Judy as she's in the middle of her recovery process. And so we're going we're gonna to pray for Judy this morning. Uh, that, you guys did great. That was awesome. Well, good morning, Judy. Uh, it's such a blessing to be able to have you with us in this way. And I know some words that uh, you have lived by and, and taught me to live by is in nothing to be anxious, but in everything with thanksgiving in our hearts to let our petitions and prayers be made known to God and that the God of peace will give us peace that passes all understanding. And so uh, it is our privilege to go with you in prayer before the Father on your behalf. So will you pray with me? Father, we uh, thank you so much for our sister Judy. We thank you for her faith And we thank you for your love and your power that responds to that faith. Mm. And so with a mustard seed of faith, Father, we come asking you this morning to bless Judy, to give her the power to grasp the width and depth and height and length of your love. Help her to know your love like she's never known before. Help her to know your presence is with her. And Father... Help her to know that uh, we love her here and we're so thankful that she is a part of our family. And so as she uh, sits at the table today and and breaks the bread of Jesus' body and drinks the uh, juice of his blood, may she know Jesus' presence there Mm -hmm. and the love that that he has for her. Father, we uh, thank you that we can all be one through you. And it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, guys, and thank you, Judy. Um, So uh, here at Sugar Grove, we have six core values, but if we were going to add a seventh, which would ruin a lot because all of our logos and designs have a hexagon, so we're not going to, but if we were going to, I think the seventh value that we would add is fun. We, we love to have fun together here at Sugar Grove. That's why we are honoring Mark Howell tonight with a Star Wars-themed retirement party. I don't like, who else would do that but Sugar Grove? Um, and one of the ways that we like to have fun, some of you guys are like, we're playing Kahoot. We're, we're not playing Kahoot. We're not. We're not playing Kahoot. We're going to this year, I promise, but not right now. Um, over, the, over March, we participated in a March Madness Bracket Challenge Uh, which is really difficult, hard to do. I read somewhere like 18% of all brackets in the world filled out a correct final four. So this is the standings of all the people who participated this year. I'm not going to point out that the best basketball player in our presence 
landed at the bottom of the standings. I'm not going to point that out to you that Danny McGrainer got last. I'm not. Uh, but we do want to honor uh, H2H Ombre. Uh, who, none of you know who that is. So we're just going to give it to Blake. No, I'm just kidding. That's Jason Toy. He won our March Madness contest. He's not here, but his wife's here. So cheer for Jason for winning our March <laughs> Madness contest. You, I'm sure I'm we know you filled his bracket out, so you keep it, you keep it, Casey. May the first shall be last. If only I had seen that before the sermon, but that's not where I was going. Uh, so anyways, that's, that's that. All right, so uh, one, of our, one of our core values is uh, service, and we believe in being incredibly intentional, intentional about creating opportunities to serve. We believe that the gospel isn't just something to be believed, but that the gospel works, like it, it, it gets to work, uh, which, oh man, Text, text, this, uh, text me um, to remember the spoken word on how the gospel works, and we'll watch it next week. Uh, it's really good. Okay, sorry. This is my brain. I apologize. Okay, uh, last year we, we did this service Sunday where we partnered with Soul Hope. Do you, do you guys remember this? If you were here, we, we cut jeans with terrible scissors that we ordered off of Amazon, and many of you were mad. And we, we, uh, we had a lot of fun together. We, we produced like 175 pairs of shoes for kids in Africa who, who didn't have a pair of shoes beforehand. And it was a whole lot of fun. And the overwhelming majority of you found me after the service and were like, hey, we have to do that again next year. We, we took some time out of the service. We, we said goodbye to the sermon, and we decided to preach with our hands that morning. And so we are going to do that again this year on April 29th. I want you to put this in your calendar. We are partnering now with somebody that we love dearly and who's been a longtime partner of Sugar Grove, Lilia's Place. This is an uh, organization in the Philippines who loves orphans and kids and people who live on the street really well. And so we're going to be partnering with them on April 29th. We're going to be putting together care packages that uh, provide uh, uh, food and health care and, and just tell people on the street that you're seen and that you're loved and that there's a God that loves you. And so put that on the calendar, April 29th. Make sure you are a part of that service project. Now, there's one other service project that we're going to do, and it's actually right now, this morning. Uh, we, we are a people who gather together in Meadows Place. Um, and so our mission statement here is for God and for neighbor. And, and we don't say for God and for Meadows Place because we, we really think that we gather together and then we disperse into multiple neighborhoods all throughout the city of Houston and that the kingdom of God is going in Siena and Meadows Place and Katy and Richmond and everywhere else that you live. But uh, we, God has placed us and we gather here in Meadows Place. Now, I used to tell you we're the only church in this square mile. But we're not now, and that's really, really exciting. There's a church that meets at the community center, uh, and that's really, really exciting. In fact, uh, over Easter, we loaned them about 30 of our chairs because their service was blowing up over Easter. Now, I did put sugargrove.org on all those chairs, so I'm just kidding. I didn't, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Uh, but it's been really fun to kind of partner with this community because, man, make no mistake about it, first and foremost, we're Team Jesus like, so I, I pray that a lot of churches come pouring into Meadows Place and the kingdom of God just shows up in a big way. So whether it's sugar, I mean, I'm biased, come to Sugar Grove, but uh, whether it's us or them. And, um, but anyways, we're in Meadows Place and over the last couple of weeks, the city of Meadows has got some pretty disturbing news in regards to the elementary school, Meadows Elementary. Uh, if you remember, as the start of the school year, we partnered with them and gave them a gift of a Starbucks gift card and a note of encouragement. And I, I actually got a letter from a teacher there that I wanted wanted to read to you guys this morning before I tell you what we're going to do. Um, uh, she says, thank you so much for the generous gift of Starbucks gift card that you sent our staff. You must know how essential a cup of coffee is for a successful start to our day as teachers. Personally, I enjoyed my note from one of the students and appreciate uh, his prayers and good wishes. I have been teaching at Meadows Elementary, get this, for 42 years and have witnessed vast changes in the teaching professions and how we are viewed. I am blessed to be a reading specialist working with students with uh, dyslexia, watching them grow and thrive into successful readers. Thank you for your kind act and prayer. I'm so appreciative of a community of faith that promotes these values. Sincerely, a teacher from Meadows Elementary. Well, the news that Meadows Elementary heard was that Fort Bend ISD kind of did this overview, and the suggestion of, uh, from this team that put this thing together was that they should shut down Meadows Elementary. And this is concerning for us as a city, for these teachers, for our students. Um, and so the, it's been really neat to watch the community rally around like, no, no. <laughs> 
We just refuse. We don't accept this. We want to see our school. Uh, we want to see teachers who have been teaching kids for 42 years to teach for a 43rd year and a 44th year and a 45th year in Meadows Place. And so um, as, as a church who finds itself in the city, who's been called by God to bless the city and to fight for the city and to be for the city, I want to invite you this morning to take a couple of minutes on the inner aisle of your section. So this aisle and then along this way and then along this way and then along these chairs and on and these chairs down this aisle. There's a card that, yeah, Casey's got it. Perfect. There's a card that says at the top of it, Dear FBISD, and then it's got some lines, and then on the bottom it has our, our name and, and mission statement. And then on the front of it, it says hashtag save me, which is hashtag save Meadows Elementary. And what I want to invite you to do, um, maybe as you're kind of like, okay, Doug's been talking a long time, so I just want a couple minutes to myself, is I want you to write a letter uh, that just says how much we love partnering with 42-year teachers who are teaching kids how to read. How much we love being a part of a city that's got a great elementary school. And then I've got some friends who are going to get these to the right people so that they can hear from the church in Meadows how much we support and love the city of Meadows and the elementary school that's a part of it. Um, if you don't have, there's, there's like, there's uh, cards in every row, and so you can, you can grab some out of the extra rows if you want to do that. And if you do that, I want to invite you to do that, and if you do, just leave it in your chair at the end of service, and we'll come by and pick it up. And like I said, we'll get it, we'll get it to the right people, okay? Is that making sense? Okay, cool. All right, very good. Lastly, there's a sermon. Don't worry, my clock's already started, I promise. But lastly, uh, over, last, so last week was Easter, and we got to celebrate Jesus' death burial and resurrection. And then in between last week and this week, I watched a really interesting video on social media. How many of you guys are, have a social media account? Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, you, you name Okay, good, good, good. What I, the video was about the damage uh, to our mental health that social media does. Now, I'm not going to tell you to delete your Facebook, though maybe you should. I, that's up to you. Um, I, use, I, I have it, okay, so I'm not throwing stones here. But what was interesting, the core of this video and the reason that this social media is such a problem is the lack of honesty when it comes to social media. What the video says is that when you and I scroll through Facebook or click through Facebook, we observe everyone's best life, their best pictures, their best moments from their vacation, their best food that they're eating. He pointed out that people who own luxury cars are two and a half times more likely to talk about their car on social media than those who don't own a luxury car. Uh, he, he looked at uh, hotels in Las Vegas and the really nice hotels. Everyone loves to post about how they just checked into the Bellagio, but no one says they checked into a lesser hotel. And as we're viewing their best life, we're comparing their best life to our real life. And as a result, we're, we're just mentally becoming depressed and isolated and alone. It, it, it works so well. I thought this was fascinating. It works so well that when you view your own profile page, which you have created yourself, which is kind of your best version of yourself, it actually increases your mental health. This is how effective it is. So here's what I don't want you to miss in this. We live in a day and age where, where brutal honesty is a breath of fresh air. Like, we, we live in a day and age where your testimony, the good and the bad of it, is, is going to be something that people have not tasted in quite some time, and it's going to strike a nerve. And so I just wanted to take this moment to thank Sean and to thank Glennell for sharing their testimonies last week. They, they didn't just give us the best version of themselves. They gave us honesty. They gave us a story of how I didn't believe and I thought this was rubbish and I thought this was silly and then, I don't know, I had, there was some time and I talked with Mark and all this other stuff and now, now I've come to, come to the table where Jesus has invited me to or Glennell talking about just this permanent pain that's with her and all these reasons that she should have tapped out and she doesn't just gloss over them, she, she, she knows them well and yet she proclaims, I have this eternal joy in spite of all that. And so I just wanted, again, uh, can we just cheer for Sean and Glennell for sharing their testimonies? And, and again, and don't, don't miss, don't miss your, your testimony, the, the good and the bad. It's a breath of fresh air in a, in a 
seemingly, more seemingly fake, fake world. Okay. All right. So last week was Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and we're going to continue on in that story in Luke. But what I want us to look at this morning is uh, Luke chapter 24 and a story of Jesus walking with two people. But this story, we're going to break up into two parts. So this morning is part one, and you got to come back next week for part two. And this story really kind of follows the plot line of almost all stories. Here, this is how most stories work. There's a character. This character has a problem. This character meets a guide who gives them a plan, calls them to action, and then it results in, if it doesn't go well, a tragedy, or if it goes well, a comedy. In fact, think about your favorite movie or TV show for a second. Can you, do you see how it fits in? In fact, talk to your neighbor. Here, talk to your neighbor for a minute or two and see if your favorite movie, here, I'll, I'll, I'll do mine. If you were here a couple weeks ago, you know one of my favorite movies is Cool Runnings. Doris is a character who wants to make the Olympics, but he can't because he trips in his race. He's got a problem, but then he meets a coach who gives him a plan, the Olymp- Winter Olympics instead of the Summer Olympics. Uh, he calls them to action, and it results in Spoiler alert, what you think is a tragedy because they, they crash and they don't win, but it, it's actually, it's not about winning. It's about trying and community and all this other stuff. So it actually results in victory. All right, that's cool running. See how it works? Talk to your neighbor about your favorite movie and see if it works there. Ready, go. Put, oh, put it back. They're requesting we put it back up. Is it making? Is it, is your is your movie fitting into the plot line of most stories? Dave, what was your movie? What else but Star Wars? Yeah. Okay. So what else but Star Wars for today? There's a guy named Luke. He has a he's got a problem, but he meets a guy named Yoda, who gives him a plan, calls him to action, and it results in. Well, do we know how it results in? Who knows, maybe in the ninth one that hasn't come out yet, Darth Vader comes back and you won't see it coming. Uh, someone over here, does, does your favorite movie fit into the plot line of a typical? Okay, I got some head nods. I'll take it. This is good enough for this morning. All right, so this morning we're going to look at a story that really kind of fits into this plot line, but we're just going to like hit the first two or three again in part one. So Luke 24, if you turned there 15 minutes ago, we're, we're there now. Here's Luke chapter 24, and we're going to start in verse uh, 13. Okay, now the the same day. Now, if you were here last week, you you remember uh, Jesus leaves the tomb empty. Some women go to adorn a body with the final ceremonial closings of a funeral, and they don't find a body there. The women run back to a room full of disciples, saying the body's gone. We learn that Peter, and then eventually we learn that several others run to the tomb and see that it's not empty, or that it is empty. On the same day, that's this day, two of the disciples were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, if you've been tracking with us on this series, you know that Jerusalem is where it's all been leading. The action, what's taking place, God's kingdom is going to be ushered in in the city of Jerusalem. So another way to read this is there's two disciples who are seven miles away from where they're supposed to be. Right? They're journeying away to Emmaus from Jerusalem. And together, they're discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. So you and I now know something that we're going to learn the characters in the story don't. That this is Jesus who's met them seven miles outside of where they're supposed to be. And this is what happens. They were prevented from recognizing him. Then Jesus asked them, what is this dispute that you're having with each other as you are walking? And they stopped walking, and they looked discouraged. The one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? Ooh, sarcasm is not a good idea. Trust me, I know. But to Jesus himself, about Jesus himself, this could go bad. But notice what Jesus responds. What things, he asked them. Jesus meets two disciples seven miles from where they're supposed to be. 
They're having an argument, a discussion. They're filled with sorrow about the things that have taken place. And Jesus says, what are you guys talking about? He goes, have you not heard what we're talking about? And Jesus just says, well, well, what things? So here's the the mini-sermon within the mini-sermon this morning. Jesus meets them where they are. Okay, so don't miss that. And then Jesus, upon hearing their discussion, their sorrow, their confusion, he asks them a question to draw out what they're feeling. And then when they kind of meet it with like a, how do you not know? He says, no, 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 seriously, tell me about what you're experiencing. What they're experiencing isn't like, we believe that Jesus is the son of God. What they're experiencing is, is pain and confusion and frustration. And Jesus sets the table for them to confess it out loud. So often, when we have doubts and confusion and questions, especially in a place like church, you almost feel like you're supposed to bottle all that up. And it leads to isolation. It leads to more depression. It leads to a feeling of aloneness, that I'm the only one who's, who's got questions. And so maybe this morning, if you've walked in with those kind of feelings, Maybe if you're like these disciples, seven miles from where you're not supposed to be. Maybe if you're like these disciples, you, you don't even see Jesus for who he is. Just, just know that we serve a Jesus who cares for you. I mean, we serve a Jesus who meets you where you are and loves you enough to draw out of you your doubts and your questions and your confusion. What a good, loving seeing Jesus we serve. Okay, back to, back to the main sermon. Okay. So, they tell him the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. They crucified our great prophet powerful in action and speech. And we, the disciples say, we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Then besides all this, it's the third day since these things had happened, and moreover, some women from our group have astounded us. They arrived at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came back and reported that they had seen a vision of angels uh, who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they didn't, they didn't see Jesus. They, they didn't see him. So he, here, do you see our character's problems. See, there's a plot point, right? The, the character who has a problem. From our perspective, the, there's two characters on the road who has a problem. They're literally talking to the Jesus they're mourning, and they don't see it. That's from our perspective. What I want us to do this morning, really quickly, is look at it from their perspective. I want you, to, you and I to try and put ourselves in their shoes and see the, their problem from their perspective. And to do that, we've got to go to a different story, a story that starts in the very, very beginning. So the Bible opens up with this good news that there's this good God who creates everything. And he says that it's good. And this story is unlike all the other stories of gods who create out of war or anger or they kind of create and then just leave it alone. But the Bible tells of a God who speaks things into existence and he says over his creation, it's good. Now in his creation, he puts a tree and tells man and woman not to eat of that tree. But there's this evil represented by the serpent in the story who compels and draws Adam and Eve to ultimately eat of a tree they're not supposed to, and they do. We're going to pick it up at the beginning of the story, then we're going to look at the end of the story, and then end at the middle. It'll make sense here in a second. All right, here's here's Genesis chapter 3. So they've eaten of the apple, and then the eyes of both of them were opened. They knew they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife Heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And so the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, where are you? Two quick points. Sin is silly. I mean, sin is genuinely silly because sin creates a shame that causes us to try and hide from God within his own creation. So sin is just, I mean, it's just silly. 
But then remember, remember how we were talking about Jesus who meets two disciples on the road seven miles from where they're supposed to be and Jesus draws them back into himself with all their confusion and doubt? Dear, do you see the same God? Oftentimes we're like, New Testament God's really nice, but Old Testament God, he's, no, no, no. God sees that they're hiding and he doesn't come showing up and going, where are you? Because you, you gotta die now. God, God says, hey, hey, hey. He calls them out of their shame. He's walking amongst them, and he calls them out and says, where are you? Draws them back to himself. And so Adam said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. So then he asked, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man replied, the woman you gave me to be with, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Typical male, not owning his problems, blaming it on someone else, and all the ladies said, amen. I, okay, I got some, yeah. Some of those amens were a little too real. I got into an argument before church. It's cool. All right, all right. So, uh, so the Lord God asked the woman, what is it that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Okay, so that's the beginning of the story. Here's the end of the story. The Lord God made clothing from skin for the man and his wife and he clothed them. Then the Lord God said, since the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out, take from the tree of life, eat, and live forever. So the Lord God sent him away from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He literally drove the man out and stationed the cherubim and the flaming whirling sword east of the garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. And from that moment on, every story you read in scripture until Revelation 21 and every story that takes place until Jesus himself comes back, which means today, every story, the setting of that story is in exile. That setting of the story is not where we were originally meant to be. And within the story is this evil wrapped up in all of it. We call it sin. So the, the, the story starts with a God who makes everything. He says it's good and beautiful and awesome. And he places the people. He loves them in it. They break the sin. And as a result, they are exiled from where they're supposed to be. If we were looking at the seven plot points, we would say the story ends in a tragedy, except for a couple of verses in the middle of the story that give us hope. He, here, here's the middle of the story. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. God says, in the midst of all of this, in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of having to drive out the people from where they were originally meant to be, he makes a promise that there is one who is coming, a descendant of Eve, who will put evil to end. Evil will do its best to take him out, but he will ultimately take evil out. He says it this way, he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. So in the middle of just a tragic, the, the worst story ever, there's this sign of hope that one day God will send one who will put an end to evil. Don't, don't make this story distant and far away. You, you feel it too. That, that, that brokenness, that, that shame, that, that frustration with yourself when you're short with someone you love again. You, you, that you can't seem to overcome this thing that just keeps tripping you up. That surely, when you look at cosmic things like racism and pornography and all kinds of just junk, you go, this is, this is not how it was supposed to be. And the Bible says, you're right. And the Bible says there's going to be one who comes who will put an end to that and then ultimately put an end to that when he comes again. The, the fancy church term is that we are a people who need to be redeemed. We are people who are in desperate need of being redeemed. And if you need a definition for it, I brought one for you because I love you. Redemption relates to deliverance from a situation or from enemies. Most often, this involves paying a price to buy back the person or thing that is being ransomed. To rescue, ransom, set free, or liberate from an oppressive condition. We are people who post the garden are in desperate 
need of redemption. If you need an actual picture of what that looks like, the story of Exodus with Moses, who sets the people free from King Pharaoh. Lots of movies have been made about it. Here's how that story starts. Therefore, tell the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from forced labor of the Egyptians and rescue you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great acts of judgment. And so now we go back to our disciples seven miles out from where they're supposed to be. They're talking with Jesus and read again what they say to Jesus. We're talking and we're mourning and we're questioning the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and then they killed him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to, say it with me, redeem Israel. We were hoping that he was going to be the evil crusher. We were hoping that he was going to be the one who would set things right and begin us on the journey back to how things were always supposed to be. But when that guy's story ends with crucifixion, my hope is gone. Uh, What I want to invite you into this morning is to join in with these two disciples who are disinterested in a Jesus who isn't Messiah and King and Savior and Redeemer. They have no time for a nice Jesus. They have no time for a Jesus who's got really good stories. They've got no time for a prophet who can do miraculous things. Did you notice they're not questioning whether he healed a blind man or told a guy who couldn't walk to walk? They're not questioning any of those things. But what these disciples know and what we so desperately need to know is that we are in need of a redeemer. We're in need of a Messiah. We are in need of one who conquers death and whose story doesn't end in crucifixion. This is what we are hungry for. This is what we are longing for. This is what keeps you up at night. This is that feeling of not being where we're supposed to be. Now, if this were a TV show, here's here's what would happen next. Next time at Sugar Grove... Find out if the disciples learned that they were talking to Jesus. Find out how. But we're not, we're not going to do that this morning. I'm going to tell you the answer, and then we're going to do it again next week anyways. Uh, so here, here's what I want you to see this morning. Uh, may we see that, that we are in need of a Messiah who crushes the evil within us and within this world. This evil that you and I, when we're really honest with ourselves and we turn off social media we admit that that we can't seem to defeat ourselves. We are in desperate need of a Messiah. We are in desperate need of a Jesus who meets us seven miles from where we're supposed to be. And, And may we see that we do. We serve a Jesus who is that Redeemer. Here's two here's two passages of scripture to encourage you, and then we're going to take communion. Here's Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way like we would have lived in the garden, to live that way now. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, this Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. And then here's Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 10. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in this Jesus Christ, the Messiah For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself according to the good pleasure of his will. It's his will that we be redeemed. It's his will that we be adopted. It's his will that meets us on the road. And and this results in the praise of his glorious grace that he has lavished on us in the beloved one, Jesus. It's in him that we have redemption. And what the disciples don't see at the time, but spoiler alert, we'll see next week, 
is that this redemption comes through that crucifixion. This redemption comes through Christ's body broken for us and his blood poured out for us, which is the forgiveness of our trespasses. And this is done according to the riches of his grace that he richly pours out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasures that he purposed in Christ. as a plan for the right time to bring everything. Remember the first story of disruption. Well, his good will is that he would bring everything together in this crucified Messiah, both things in heaven and things on the earth in him. May we see we need a redeemer. May we see we need a Messiah.